Okay. There it is. Right. Usually it asks you where you want to store the file. So maybe after you've done it a few times, it just knows. Yeah, it knows. Okay. So let me, um, well, before we even start, I told you I was going to add a little bit to my the testimony where I was away from the Lord. So, and, and there, there's a reason for it I wanted to share. But I said um, that it bothered me because the Lord didn't take care of what I call his people around the world. Remember I said a missionary in yeah. South America that was shot in an airplane and went the bullet went all the way through the wife and an infant that she was holding and killed both of them. And I, and I said, that's not right. And then a pastor, I believe in Houston, was electrocuted doing a, a baptism. And then also in the Philippines, a Muslim man was shot by the, by the good guys. Here comes somebody. Oh, that's Barry too. Uh, oh, he's getting on the phone, I guess. Barry, are you there? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear us all right? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, feel free to jump in there if you have a question. But anyway, that really threw me. I said, Lord, Lord that shouldn't have happened. You, you know, you should have kept that from happening or something like that. And it really bothered me. And it caused me to kind of spiral down, I guess you could say. But I, I thought about that later because years later, somebody's come. There's Al. Excuse me a minute. Hello, Al. Yeah, we're adding it right now. You want to say something there, buddy? <laughs> no. Uh, hang on a minute and I'll send you a link. Oh, well, I don't know how to do all that. I better send you a link. Hang on a minute. I'll send it to you. All right, bye. Uh, just, just Al's going to join us. So pardon me one second. Let me uh, invite him. Uh, okay, participants. Come on now. Well, yeah, I did it. Sorry, folks. Participant, okay, invite, there it is. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I think that, made a, huh? Why he's coming on, he made a comment last night, or Friday night, he said the four beasts. Yeah, hello? Gary, you're not on. Gary, you just froze up. Is that Bill there with you, Sherry? You know the, the uh, angels that guard the four, the four faces? He said, my back. Yeah, you're kind of breaking up a little bit. Go ahead. All right. Al said something Friday night. He said the four beasts, the angels. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. Uh, the faces that were, that were the, the four gospels. I hadn't heard that before. I didn't hear all of it because I started trying to listen to it and the thing kept buffering and, you know, I finally quit listening. But uh, I didn't know, I didn't know that either, but I guess that's opinion. I don't know. He, he, Man, he's coming I don't on know I, You can argue that with him. <laughs> well, no, I've never heard that before and I was wanting to know if I heard right first. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard him say the uh, 24 <laughs> elders... Hello? Yeah. What'd she say? Go ahead. I heard him say the 24 elders were the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 apostles or disciples. And I've heard that before, but, uh, you know, who knows? That's what I thought. <laughs> but uh, anyway, let's see. I don't know why I was not here yet. Let me go ahead with my what I was saying. Uh, I felt like the Lord should have intervened to help those people that were Christians and and then bad things happened to them and it really bothered me and and I kind of, like I said I kind of spiraled out from there but years later I, you know well I got back in church and the Lord started restoring me but then eventually you know we we lost Jeremy and I thought I said if I hadn't gone through that maybe where I had to just learn to trust the Lord no matter what 
that uh, I don't know how I could have could have dealt with that. But I, from the very beginning, I just said, Lord, I don't understand all this, but I trust you that that you're a merciful God and that you you did what was best or, you know, it's all going to be OK and sweet by and by. So hello, Al. Hey, how you doing? OK, yeah. Gary's got a beef with you, so he wants to complain. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to hear it. <laughs> well, no, I don't have a beef. You made a comment the other night uh, uh, about the, the the four faces of the angel. Uh, the beast. Cherubim. The beast, yeah. The uh, beast. They were the four gospels. Right. Is that what you said? Uh, is that what you said? Yeah, that's what I said. Okay. I, I, I haven't ever heard that before. I was trying to make that connection. Well, Brother Miller taught that, and so I was trying to kind of show that, you know, where it says they praise the Lord continuously, and they're, and they're always, um, they're out there all the time. They never cease to, to worship God, and so those four Gospels are constantly, no matter whether people are reading or not, they're out there, and they all exalt Christ, and they, of course, they lead us to Christ, too, and they're his words, so it's, it's figurative of what those four gospels are and that's the way i see it yeah i was wondering though i don't want to interrupt this class but i was wondering did it break up on you quite a bit yes it did on the recording yeah well i was watching the recording and it kept uh buffering and right delaying and then it would it seemed like you were talking real fast because it was making up for it i think yeah i was wondering if it did that in live time was it doing that live gary I didn't notice it to be that bad. Well, you'd have noticed. I never noticed to speed up or slow it. down. Yeah, it was very irritating. Yeah. You know. so, okay. Well, that's all right. I don't want to interrupt your class. Go ahead. Well, we're just barely getting started. Bill and Sherry, turn your ta camera down so I can see your sweet smiling face. <laughs> yeah, we got to have someone pretty on this picture. You know? <laughs> uh. Okay. <laughs> Obedient daughter. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I thank the Lord for um, for bringing me back. I, you know, I was talking before you got on there, Al, about how I had uh, gotten away from the Lord for a while. But I said, in the long run, it may have helped me. Once uh, we lost Jeremy, that, that experience that I had way back then probably helped me when we lost him. So, who, you know. So anyway, I've been talking about that. Uh, I do want to say one thing that I heard uh, some very complimentary things about Melody that your hospital or somebody recognized you for all the good service up there and gave you a uh, commendation or something, Melody. Um, I got the um, Mercy Award 2021 Great. for right. the for the whole hospital. I'm very I'm very proud, yes, humble, and uh, I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, they 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 number they uh, nominate one out of uh, Sumner Regional, out of Gallatin, um, and that's uh, we're kind of a umbrella from that hospital. Wow! So um, I was very shocked, yeah. <laughs> very shocked. Well, I wanted to I wanted to announce that publicly because we're very proud of you, and I think uh, you should be. Well, recognized. thank you, thank you. Congratulations! Yes. Yeah. Um, Al Melody said she was in the hospital how long overnight or a couple of days I was in the hospital a, a day and overnight I just got home from the hospital today wow, from gosh. the hospital but I, I'm, I'll be okay <laughs> well you hurt your neck and back right <laughs> yeah uh -huh. yeah to patience okay anyway let's get going on we took a little time but that's okay we can fellowship and talk about some things so let me go uh, to our lesson and pick it up here share there it is now we've all seen this screen several times now um we're of course we're building on our foundation of no early removal of the church we do believe in the rapture but not until the end no jewish triumph it's not about the jews it's about the spiritual jews which is the church and and then maybe the millennium i know we got different opinion different opinions on that but anyway last week we um started into dualism and revelation and uh well the week before that we covered the seven trumpets and the seven vials we compared them 
and this is where I first started getting hooked into this um, subject because the similarities were so exact that it was just amazing to me. So then I started looking for additional similarities and uh, I believe Al told me that the um, man child and 144,000 were the same thing, uh, which as soon as he told me, it just clicked. And I said, yes, that makes sense. It just clicked. Uh, and so then to last week we covered 144,000 in the man child, but um, we didn't have time to go to the multitude comparing the multitude that no man can number and to the woman in the wilderness. So we're going to do that today. And to me, it, to me, it's clear to you, it might not be as clear. So we just covered, uh, one thing I did want to say, it's just like Al said, um, concerning the four beasts that he, he felt like that, that represented the four gospels. And then he said, that's my opinion. A lot of what I've said here, uh, is kind of, I'm going to, I hate to say it's all my opinion because we do back it up with scripture and it just makes sense. And some of this stuff comes together, it just makes sense. But uh, like last week, I conjectured on who the two witnesses were or are going to be. But again, if you go talk to the pastor down the street or something, he'll go, what? That's, that's not right. In other words, that's my opinion. And, and as it comes from uh, studying. I, I just felt like the Lord just showed me that. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be right, but let me, I want to take um, eschatology for a second. And let's pretend we got this blackboard 10 feet high and 15 feet long, and we just start filling in all over the chalkboard about eschatology. We're drawing line, timelines, and Jesus is coming down, and the devil's coming up, and we got the battle of Armageddon and the battle of Gog and Magog and all this stuff's going on. It all falls into the category of eschatology. But when you get to the very bottom and you draw a line underneath everything and you say, let's summarize eschatology. That's where my opinions, some of my opinions come from. Because here's a summary in my viewpoint. When all the dust settles, the bride will be glorious. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That makes yeah. sense. So yeah. even if we're wrong about something over here, or maybe we don't have this right, I'm sure we do. There's all kinds of, there's so much in the Bible and there's so much in Revelation that we probably will be uh, studying it for millenniums or something. But anyway, but the theme behind what I share and what Al shares and everything is what, we, and what we've learned is that the bride is going to be front and center and God's going to do a work with the church and the bride is going to be glorious by the time it's all over. And that's just the opposite, in my opinion, of standard doctrine or Darbyism versus Danielism, as I like to put it, because I, I might have it here. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, I call it overview of eschatology, SPD, standard Protestant doctrine, and I, and I call it gloom and doom. So one person said, he felt like the next thing ahead for the church is the rapture, which means uh, we're just getting out of here. God can't do too much with the church. And then David Jeremiah, who's very quite famous, and he has a huge church in California, and he uh, has written all kinds of books, and he's like an authority. Uh, he said the next thing ahead for the church is the great falling away of the church and then the rapture. So either way, it it's like the church ends in failure, as far as I'm concerned. We just have to sneak out of here in a whimper, so to speak. And God can't really do anything with it or doesn't want to do anything with the church. And then, he, and then he's going to do something with the Jews, I guess. And so I absolutely reject that. And um, what have I got down here? Oh, here it is. When I, I, I'm just quoting what I just said. When all the dust of the uh, the tribulation end time events has settled the church will be victorious and glorious and so that's where my understanding when i projected or guessed or gave my opinion of who the two witnesses are which i said were the uh, the man child and the hundred forty four thousand, uh that comes from my opinion of that the church is going to be glorious and we don't have to go back to the old testament and find some holy men of God, even though they were holy, no, no doubt. We don't have to go back there. Well, there's going to be holy men of God today, too. And God can use people in the church. And, of course, once you say the two witnesses are 
like 144,000, that's not a single person or that's not two people, that's a body of people. And so that's the way I see it. I believe there's gonna be a remnant or something come forth from the church, even though the church is gonna be glorious too. The church is gonna be, um, I mean, in Revelation 12 describes the church as having uh, 12 stars around her head and she's uh, clothed in the sun and the moon under her feet. So that's glorious description right there in itself. So anyway, I wanted to kind of throw that out there and summarize, take the whole scope of, of eschatology and boil it down to one sentence. There it is. When, when it's all said and done, the church is going to be glorious. So to me, that's edifying. When you say, well, we're going to just sneak on out of here because God can't do anything with us, then that, it's like, why even? I mean, that's just almost discouraging to me. So uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to be getting into Samuel a little bit later on, but first I want to go to Revelation, and we're going to talk about um, the uh, multitude that no man can number, and let me find it. Oh, here it is. Uh, here, is that on the screen? Oh. You're on the screen. Is that? Uh, There's hell. No, I mean... Uh, I don't know if I told it to share. Hang on a minute. You got to get this right or it won't do right. Let's see. Share screen. Okay, that's what I was supposed to do. Okay, here. Share. There. Is that on there? Yeah. Okay, yep. you, can, you can see the, the uh, AutoCAD share screen. Uh, all right, let's see. What am I doing? Okay. Hang on. I'll, I'll get it right here in a minute. Um now, this right here that I'm scrolling through, this is 144,000 that we discussed last week. Uh, and I just wanted to tie it in because this is uh, Revelation chapter 7. And at the end, end of this description, here's verse 8. And it's, it's saying 12,000 from these tribes, which added up to 144,000. And then right after that, I want to tie this together. That's what I'm trying to do here. So here's Revelation 7 continued. And now we have the description of the great multitude that no man can number. So before we read it, I want you to understand that this description comes forth right after the, the introduction of the 144,000. So let's read that together. He said, and after this, after what? After he introduced 144,000, I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man can number. Now that's right off the bat. We know that there's a number for everything. So to say that no man can number uh, you know, in my opinion, doesn't make complete sense because we can number anything. But this is part of the de description here. So no man can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne. They're already in a good place, aren't they? And before the lamb clothed with what? White robes and palms in their hands. So these these aren't uh, shabby people. <laughs> if you understand what I mean, they they're holy. And so, so is the woman, the way that she's described in Revelation 12, she's holy too. So here's the multitude. Let's go on down. But anyway, they're, they're clothed in white robes. They're standing before the lamb and cried with a loud voice saying, salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell down before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Praise the Lord. That that's what we're supposed to be doing every day as we walk uh, with the Lord, as we're washing our robe, we're trying to bec become righteous. I mean, if you understand what I mean, we are righteous in one sense, but God wants us to continue to grow and become mature in him. So it says, these have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb because of what he did for us. So here's the part we want to really focus in on. This is the multitude that no man can number. And it says, therefore, because of this, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. This is very relevant here in a minute. 
he, the one that sits on the throne is going to dwell with them. That's exciting to me right there. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So this is just um, exciting stuff to me uh, that Jesus is going to dwell among his people before it's over. Now, remember, in lessons past, I said uh, he, from Ephesians that first it says, husband, love your wives as, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then it goes on and says that he might present the church to himself before he before he presents the church to himself, he's going to dwell among the church and make us holy and righteous. That's the exciting part to me, which I believe, as we've discussed, that that's going to take place, especially in the um, in the wilderness or in the place of safety, where God's going to do a special work on the earth, and then he will present a righteous church to himself. So this is just amazing stuff to me. So I hope it, it means something to you. And by the way, this takes... A period of time according to the way it appears from uh, where we're going here in revelation 12 it takes a period of time of about three and a half years not about it says exactly three and a half years which appears to be literal very much so it appears to be literal so that's the description of the um the multitude that no one no man can number now we want to compare that to the woman that brings forth a man child and then flees into the wilderness. Now, remember right here, at first the 144,000 are introduced and then it falls right behind them with this description of the great multitude. Now we're gonna go look at the, the woman and she brings forth the man child and then it's the description of the woman is falls right behind the man child. So let's go over there, if I can get to it, see if I'm in the right place, yes, okay. Now here's, uh, we're, we're back to Revelation 12, which we already covered some uh excuse me i don't mean to keep jumping in and out on you but here we have the uh, great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun which i believe represents jesus in the parable of the uh, wheat and the tares it said once the tares are gathered together and burned then shall the righteous shine forth in the sun so this says a woman clothed with the sun which to me just means with jesus and the moon under her feet which as we said represents uh, the devil, and she's victorious over the devil. I believe that's what it means right there. And upon her head, a crown of 12 stars. So she's definitely uh, spoken of very well right here, but she's wanting, she's getting ready to bring forth a, a child and the dragon is there. He wants to destroy the child. So I'm going to skip over this a little bit because we already read it. It's, verse five says, she brought forth a man child or a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And we discussed that the rod of iron, uh, there, there is a scripture that's very specifically said that Jesus will rule the nations with a rod of iron. But there's also uh, a verse in the beginning of Revelation that says that uh, to them that overcome, which is talking about the churches, and uh, seven churches, uh, one of the churches described it, to them that overcome, I will grant to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So this does not mean that it has to be Jesus. In fact, most people believe this is referring to Jesus, and they say the woman is Israel. And of course, we've already discussed that, but I don't believe that's correct at all. And so, again, we have something that, um, <laughs> excuse me a minute, my mind's wandering a little bit. I was, <laughs> but anyway, we have something here that's, uh, you know, some people are going to take it a different way. Now, let me. <laughs> I'm going to just deviate just for a second here. I was in church today. We've been having revival, and the, pre the preacher is very good, and I like him. But <laughs> I've talked to Al about this before. Al, you still there? I don't see your picture. You know, man, you're missing out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still here. Okay, long as yeah, we see you. <laughs> I don't see him, so anyway, that's all right. But uh, Al and I have talked about it. Sometimes, you know, you go to a church and you go to a church and they keep talking about the Jews are going to do this and Jews are going to do that. And, and um, 
you know, Satan's not bound to, yeah, that's going to happen in the millennium. And after a while, it just wears on you because it, I always feel like it just takes uh, some knowledge that we have been shown and tramples on what, I don't, the, the good things of God, it tramples on the promises we've been given, the understanding we've been given. And when you hear that over and over, and usually I just try to, you know, just don't say anything, it doesn't matter. I'm certainly not there to be argumentative or anything like that. But he hit on that again, and it just grates on me. And it, and it doesn't, it doesn't like make me mad. It, it hurts me. I said, don't say that. You know, I'm thinking to myself, but he's, what he said was, uh, he talking about sin and so forth. Okay, good. And then he said, um, he was kind of mocking somebody. He said, well, don't you know that uh, Satan is bound today? Which, of course, I agree with it. He is bound. That doesn't mean he has no limitations, but uh, but he is bound. He's He has limitations that he can only go so far. But so he's kind of mocking somebody that said that, which is, I, I agree with that, that, some, that Satan is bound today. And then he goes, I'll tell you how bound he is. He's bound to lead you into sin. So he made a joke out of it. And okay, I mean, I, I know, but it just hurts you. I mean, I, you get around that for so long and it just wears on you, wears on you. And then they were talking about millennium, this is going to happen. And it's, gonna, it's like, it just, you, you grow weary of it after a while. And uh, I don't think I told Al this, but I finally, I may have mentioned this last week, but we talk about the lion laying down with a lamb and the wolf laying down with a calf. And, oh, it's just going to be wonderful. We're going to sit around and watch the animals um, be at peace with one another. It's going to be wonderful, isn't it? And um, all of a sudden, it just clicked in my mind what that really represented because there's two places in Isaiah where it mentions that, the lion and the lamb and the wolf. And, and, and um, the first one is very clearly talking about the coming of the Messiah, which came, that happened 2,000 years ago. That already happened. And then the second one is, is not quite as obvious, but it's the same theme. And so I, I thought to myself, how, how did Christ come and help the lion to lay down with the lamb? You know, so you're trying to think that through, and all of a sudden it just clicked to me. I'll share it with you. And what happens is our this beast within us called our self nature has been tamed by the lamb of God coming into our heart. And now the lion lays down and is at peace because the lamb is there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. Man, it was, it was accomplished at the cross. Yeah, it was. Prophecy. But it's not about some animals out there in the field. The lion's going to eat grass now instead of the lamb. It's about our nature, our aggress this aggressive nature that's against us, the Bible says, being transformed because the lamb came and died for us, for our sins. They're missing the whole point. I'm sitting there going, you know, you're missing the point. That's not what it means. What, what are you talking about? All this, oh, it's going to be wonderful. We're going to, you know, all this, gonna, taking it literally again. Um, and it just, after a while, just, it wearies you. Is that right, Al? <laughs> yeah, it robs you. I mean, it robs the, the truths of the gospel. You know, it, 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 it diminishes what Christ did. That's what bothers you. Yeah, when he said, well, you know, go ahead, Gary. Well, you guys, you know, me sitting out back here, I listen to other people, and I'm thankful for you guys to, uh, to get your opinion, but you hear all kinds of stuff out there, what stuff means. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you, this is new to me, what you're saying. So well, it's, you know, it's always to good to have new opinion and you got to evaluate. It. It's new to me, too. I just that just clicked in my mind probably two, three weeks ago. Uh, but oh. it's an it's a spiritual understanding of this literal uh, scripture talking about animals getting along. Who cares that animals get along? That, what's that got to do with the kingdom of God? But when you understand that this beast within you is going to be tamed by the spirit of God, then all of a sudden that's edifying that I care about that. And so it just makes sense. It just plus, like I said, the, the scripture in Isaiah is talking about the coming of the Messiah. So what's animals lying down in the field next to each other got to do with that? Nothing. 
So well, does that go back to Genesis where the lion and the lamb lay together before Noah's flood and that's all they have to reference it to? So they say, well, that's what it means. I'm not following about Genesis. Um, well, before, you know, in the garden, they was they wasn't yeah, they were, weren't you know, they weren't eating each other. Oh. You know, but after the fall, they did and uh, and I think he's using that as a picture of a spiritual right. thing because we have a lion nature, a rebellious nature, and God is going to tame that and make us like lambs. We're, we're to be conformed to Christ, so we become lambs, you know, the lamb of God, lambs of God, rather, not the lamb, but lambs of God. So, right. Anyway, go ahead. Well, uh, so you already you already shared that uh, opinion now. Well, that's what we that's what we believe, yeah. I had never heard that before. I, I, Brother I, Randall taught that. Really? I hadn't, yeah. I hadn't heard that. I just all of a sudden it just clicked as I was reading. I was reading about John the Baptist and he was declaring the coming of Christ. And or no, it was his dad, uh, is it Zacharias was prophesying about the coming of John the Baptist when he was still a baby. And uh I forget how the wording goes, but it it, it said something about to bring peace to something. And anyway, all of a sudden it just clicked. I said, that's the lion and the lamb lying down together right there. Mm -hmm. I never had heard that before, but it's like it just clicked. So that's uh, it's encouraging, you know, when the Lord just shows you something. And so I'm glad that uh, you guys are, know as much as I do, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's why I'm here. I'm trying to learn something. No, no. Well, I'm glad you uh, added added that. So we're a little bit informal here, everybody, but that's good. I, that's the way I like it to be. Okay, but what I wanted to focus on here was the woman. What happens to the woman, which we believe is a church, what happens to her when she flees into the wilderness, which we believe to be the, the place of refuge. So she brought forth the man child. And in verse six, it says she fled into the wilderness. Now here I got some, some things underlined where she hath a place prepared of God. This place is not just some random place that it's like, oh, I think I'll just send the church out here or something. God has prepared it. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. But it's, there's nothing accidental happening. It's all planned and it's all the way it's supposed to be and God ordained it and it's going to happen. Okay, so she goes to a place prepared of God and had, wait, well, while I'm there, oh, I think later on it says that she was given two wings of an eagle to fly. So we're going to touch on that. Uh, yeah, it's down here further. Okay, we're going to touch on that. But anyway, she, she goes to a place prepared of God and look what it says, that they should feed her there are 1,203 score days, which we know from our previous classes, exactly three and a half years. Exactly three and a half years. So we talked about the three and a half years, and we're going to get into that more uh, later on when we study some things from Daniel. So right now she's in a place prepared of God, and she's being fed. And I don't think it's, we're talking about physical food. That's not what we're worried about. Okay, and so now we're jumping down from verse 6 to 13 because we uh, it wasn't talking much about the woman right there. Okay, so it says, when the da uh, dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So he wants to persecute the church. And it says he does for, for a little bit at least. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished. Here we have some of the same terminology she is nourished up, up, up earlier it said that she was fed that they shall feed her and it says here time times and half a time there's the three and a half years again that we talked about so we're going to talk about this eagle a little bit later on too but that's just uh i used to say why an eagle why doesn't she get um four legs like a bear so she can walk into the wilderness you know just just being kind of silly but yet why an eagle and uh but it says an eagle she's given two wings that she might fly herself, basically, the way I read that, the eagle didn't transport her, she flew herself into the wilderness, or she moved from where she was to the wilderness, so, so, it go, she goes into her place, and she is nourished for three and a half years, same stuff, okay, and the serpent cast out his mouth, water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood, and the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. So uh, 
Let's, let's go on. Let's see. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with a remnant of her seed. Now, this is what we talked about last week, because if, if you read it carefully, the Satan comes against the woman. So she was given the ability to flee, which she does. And now it, it doesn't say she, the devil turns, but it's kind of implied that the dragon was wroth with a woman and turned. I, I put that in there to go and make war with the remnant of her seed or her offspring. Remember that from last week. So in other words, the, the dragon cannot get to the woman now, but he can get to her offspring, which is very <laughs> important there. You got a good picture there, Larry and Melody. <laughs> Can't tell. Can't uh, tell. <laughs> okay, so that's when we talked about the, her offspring being the man child and the, I, I believe, or I, this is a theory now, keep, keep it in mind, that um, first of all, her offspring is a man-child, which is also the 144,000. Mm. I consider them to be, I look at them as being uh, the two witnesses, and I started to say something else right there, but I forgot. Um, went, go to my... <laughs> Boja. Yeah. Uh, do you have any do you have any insight on why it's called a man child it just means male child is all it means male child yeah i, don't know, I guess i'm looking it's not we, like some from for some spiritual application there no i, I mean know. we're going to talk in a minute about uh samuel he was a male child yeah. and which i seems to be a correlation of this very thing i i believe but, well, uh, Brother Randall talked that it was uh, a mature, a mature child. In other words, using the term man, yeah. you know, a child, we think of a babe, but this is a mature church. It's not just a, a mature, a mature body of Christ, yeah. not some newborn, you know, Christians and things. Okay. So whatever that's worth. Yeah. Uh, what I was going to say was, um, in other words, if we decipher what we just said here, the her offspring is stronger than she is. Would you agree with that, Al? Yes, yeah. Okay, you see that? Her offspring has come into maturity that we're just talking about. And then if we compare that with 144,000, remember there were three things. She's a virgin, she's without fault, and she's the first fruits unto God, or the 144,000 are. So she's very mature. And she's more actually developed or uh, closer to God or stronger that's, that's than the church is. But the church is still described as, as being very glorious. Hello, Kat. <laughs> I've, I've always seen it as uh, two, um, 144,000 a man child, that the man child comes from the 144,000. To me, it means they're more mature or even greater power than the 144,000. Now, of course, you say it's the same thing, they're the same thing, but that's just the way I've, I've, I see it. Well, okay? We have different opinions. <laughs> well, but where do you get that? Well, I just in fact, just what you said that you know they're they're more um, perfected, I would think, or more overcomers. Um, that the, the one hundred forty four thousand are well, they're elect, but uh, the man child is even more perfect. More, I don't know, because it came from the one hundred forty four thousand. Okay, well, then you'd have to say that the 144,000 and the woman are the same thing. No. Mm -mm. Anyway, go okay. on, go on, Wayne. Okay. <laughs> Ignore me. <laughs> well, that's okay. We're here to that's discuss okay. it. Now. Okay. Uh, anyway, as I've already said, we started out with the seven tr trumpets and the seven vials, and then we compared the 144,000 and the man child, very mature uh, body of Christ. And now we're comparing the um, multitude that no man can number with the woman. So let's go over here and I want to show side by side what we just read together and, and it's over here. Okay, everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. So on the left, we have multitude that no man could number and it said they are before the throne of God. And over here, it says the man child goes, no, I'm sorry, the woman goes to a place prepared for her by God. It's not exact. Over here, it's on the multitude. It says, Jesus dwells among them. The one that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. 
and then it says the lamb feeds them and over here it says that they will be fed for three and a half years over here it says um they shall hunger and thirst no more and over here it says she is nourished again three and a half years i was looking for three and a half years over here with a multitude but it doesn't say it but that's why if you sort of uh, begin to realize that we got two things describing the same event then you can put them together and get more information but anyway over here she's nourished there she's being fed over here the lamb feeds them they shall hunger and thirst no more and and then no sunlight or heat to me represents being protected i mean the sunlight doesn't hurt you of course uh but it, it's an idea is you find it a lot in um isaiah that it says no light uh, or heat shall be on them. In other words, they're protected. They, they're protected from what's going on maybe outside. And so over here, the woman is protected from the serpent and I believe also from the tribulation. So you, you can say, well, that's interesting. I didn't prove it. And maybe, maybe it doesn't. To me, it's just very clear. It's talking about the same, same thing. The multitude that no man can number comes forth after the 144,000. The woman comes is described after the man child comes forth and so uh any question anybody got a comment on that uh, do you think uh that makes sense to you or what chris i always have questions you know uh, okay well ask a question well first of all the multitude that no one can number you, you know you said earlier that there is no number that can't be, I mean, a number right. that can't, but I think what he's talking about, he's talking about from people from the beginning of creation to the end when Christ comes. And it's like when he told Abraham, count the stars. It's not that they can't be numbered, yeah. but they can't be, I no mean, way. what man can ever fathom that, you know? So same thing here. But when it comes to the part about the multitude that no man can number and the woman in the wilderness, I'm not sure because the multitude that no man can number to me, it includes everybody from creation till he comes, whereas the woman in the wilderness is the people that are alive at the time of the last days. I mean, they, they have the same characteristics. They're still part of God's body. They're Christians, we would call them. But I don't know if you could say they're exactly the same group. You know what I mean? Well, yeah, I hear you. I'm listening. Um, so, I mean, I'd have to kind of wade through that a little bit, but on the surface... But why um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to. I mean, he still, he, he does prepare us and we, they will be before the throne. They are. And they, he feeds us and he keeps us in, in drought and in, in the heat and whatever. He's always keeping us. He's, a, right. he's always there for the whole multitude. But this last group that go into the wilderness is a special time that God is doing a special work. Right. Affecting. Yeah. But I mean, we I'm not can sure we can, what what good it what what is uh, advantage there is to describing people that have served the Lord since the beginning of time over here when it's talking about Revelation and the things that are happening at the end. But uh, okay, I'm, that's a another way of looking at it too. Uh, I'll look at it a little more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's what I that's the way I see it. That there's. The 144,000, the man child are the same thing. The multitude is the same as the woman. Woman, they are fed, they are nourished, they're they're protected, and both of them, and by the Lamb of God from the very throne of God. So it's very um, uh, encouraging to me and exciting. I hate, I hate to use the word exciting too much, but but yet it's just something special when you think about God doing something in the church. That's that's what motivates me, as opposed to as I described a minute ago, the gloom and doom people saying, no, all we can hope for is the church is going to fall away and then God's going to get us out of it. That's, that's the description of the church. And I just absolutely cannot, uh, I don't agree with that at all. So any well, comments, putting, we're going to go, go ahead. Well, the churches nowadays all put their, their faith in uh, the rapture. You know, when they yeah realize the rapture is not going to take place they're all going to be stumbling around yeah I, I believe that's why i always it never hurt bothered me to say this because you don't want to teach something that's false but it, this here even if you were wrong which i don't believe we are at all but at, at the at the worst we're, we're teaching the worst case we're saying the church is going to go through hard times and it's going to be persecuted and uh 
but God's going to take care of us. Whereas other people say, oh, I'm not even going to be here. I don't have to worry about it. So yeah, and hey, this the is the worst that, case. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, they're the ones that will be lost at the end times, too. Because they well, don't I know believe, what to do. Well, I think there's all kinds of uh, really good people in the church today. They love the Lord. And I, I, there's a bunch of them in my church and in every church. There are people that love the Lord and so forth. And I believe God will show them when time comes, they will... Um, they will just begin to understand. And even like, I think Melody said, how will people know uh, where the refuge is or, or how to go to the refuge? And I said, somehow the Lord will show, you know? Yeah. And and while I'm right there on that subject, I was, um, this is something else I thought of. We, you know, we, we're talking about the man child being very mature and being born as a, a full grown man. I, you know, I was uh, reading, which we're getting ready to go into about Samuel. And it says that he, grew uh, i believe it says in stature in other words he was a, just a very small child when he first went to the priesthood and they started but he grew in knowledge and and size and so forth so maybe the man child grows over a period of time i don't know i mean i'll just mention that uh it's very mature he is very mature but maybe it's a, uh there's a process that he goes through to become very mature mm -hmm. so it's just a thought just a thought so let's go to, I'm going to go now to um, 1 Samuel. Let me get, uh, quit sharing this here. Stop share. And now we're going to share something else. Be back here. There we are. Okay. This here, we're studying, we're studying eschatology and we're studying Revelation especially, but this is all the way back in Samuel. All I want to do here is, show the similarities between just this little story about Samuel being born and this major story here in Revelation about uh, a holy church bringing forth a very mature product, if you will, or remnant. So it's just very, it's interesting, but it's also um, very edifying to me. When I started seeing that, I went, wow, look at this here. Uh, I got my note here. Remember the scripture regarding eagle's wings. I'm going to bring that out at the end. Okay, but uh, the short story of Samuel is mm -hmm. a male child he came forth from his praying mother, who's a righteous woman. We're talking about the woman and the man child. Here we go. So uh, let me let's read through this. It's going to be a little bit of scripture to read, but we'll try to kind of gloss over and not spend too much time on. But it's just encouraging to me that this story talks about a righteous male child being born and he replaced a dead church at that time that's the that's the whole summary of the whole thing and that's uh that's again exciting i hate to keep using that word but it, it does it does get me going you know okay so first samuel 1 1 now and and now there was a certain man of uh, matthew and said him of <laughs> mount ephraim and his name was elkanah and the sons blah 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 okay and he had two wives uh, I'm trying to get to that. <laughs> and he had two wives. The name of one of them was Hannah. This is uh, the woman that we're interested in right now. And the name of the other one was Peniah or Peniah or something. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, now Eli is the chief priest at this time. And he's, uh, his sons are very wicked and he's not too concerned about it. At least, I, I mean, almost the best you could say for him. He's very um, uh, lukewarm, I, I guess, uh, if you had to try to give a description of him. Uh, so, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. And when the time uh, was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penia, Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters portions. Click up a little more. But unto Hannah, he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb, and her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So the other wife was kind of like uh, making fun of her that she, she couldn't bear children. And 
as he did so year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her, the, the other wife. Therefore, Hannah wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah to her husband to her, Hannah, why weepest thou and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than 10 sons? So, uh, I was trying to um, pause there a minute, uh, thinking about how that applied to the church today. Sometimes we groan within ourselves to, to uh, quote some scripture from Romans that uh, we groan to be liberated from this body of death that we have and to be set free into the liberty of God. So that's what it just made me think of that when she's uh, weeping and longing for a righteous son. Right? So let's go back to number nine. So, Santa, so Hannah rose up after they had eaten the shallow and after they had drunk. Now Eli, the priest, sat upon a seat by post of the temple of the Lord. Let's go on now. And she was in bitterness of soul. And I hope that's where the church is today. We're in bitterness of soul and weeping within ourselves, desiring to, to be more righteous, I guess, to be closer to the Lord. And it was verse 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember sure. me and not sure. forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child. Here we go. A male child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Um, makes me think of uh, Samson. Uh, no razor was supposed to come on the head of Samson. Uh, verse 12, and it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. He saw her moving her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, how long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not uh, thine handmaid. Let's see. We're in word here. Um, You're going to get that to by yourself. And... Uh, 18, and she said, let thine handmaid, okay, wait a minute, I'll, I'll skip it down. Okay, verse 16, count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial. In other words, I'm not drunk, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken here to. Then Eli answered and said, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. So right here, I thought it was kind of interesting that even though Eli was very, I'm going to be kind and say he's a lukewarm priest. It, he he spoke for the Lord and said the, that uh, the God of Israel grant thee thy petition. So that's kind of interesting to me. And so she said, uh, let thine handmaid, handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to the house of Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Wherefore, it came to pass when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived. So now she conceived that she bare a son. So her prayer was answered. God blessed her and she conceived. And now she has a male uh, child and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. Al, you remember what Samuel stands for? I looked that up one time. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. I don't remember. It mean, anyway, Samuel means something, and uh, uh, Hannah was very thankful for her son. Uh, and the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Uh, and Elkanah, her husband, said unto to her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. Verse 24, And when she had weaned him, she took him, took him up with her and three bullocks and one ephah, ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And when she slew a bullock 
and brought the child to Eli. Uh, oh, and they slew. And she said, oh, my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I pray, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore, also, I lent him to the Lord or committed him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Okay. Um, okay, now we're to the second chapter uh, where it's getting in more into what we're looking for. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. Now we're jumping down to verse 11. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child administered unto the Lord before Eli and the, the priest. So this is little uh, Samuel, and he's, uh, he's in the um, presence of the chief priest, and he's ministering with, uh, with Eli and the other priests. So Hannah has brought forth a male child, and she's given him to the Lord, and now he's in uh, in the church, if you want to look at it that way. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. Uh, anyway, it goes down and describes that the sons of Eli were um, very sinful. Uh, let's go ahead and read. I want to say something right here. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child. Now, he's still a child, but he's ministering in the temple. And he's girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Um, I don't know if you want to hear this little story, but uh, we know the story of Joseph and uh, a coat of many colors. Now here it just said he made him a little coat. Uh, so it doesn't say uh, about many colors. But I want to share something with you that I thought was pretty good. One time I was trying to um, understand uh, about the, the coat of many colors. And I was thinking, I was trying to compare it with something. Um, and I said, well, if, uh, if a woman's going to make, or it doesn't have to be a woman, but if, if somebody's going to make a, a garment of some kind, whether it's a shirt or a, co a little coat or a dress, uh, they have a pattern and then they spread the material out and they pin the pattern onto the material and then they cut it out. And so um, this, the um, the main part there is uh, I, I, I kind of uh, equated the main part of the shirt or whatever is being made as to be in the church. You, you have to kind of follow me here. <laughs> so then you have the remnant left over. The, all the scraps are the remnant. And some of it is so small it's not it doesn't have any value, so it's thrown away. But then you have these pieces left over, and you say, well, those are too too big to just throw away. And so they would just save them, put them aside and say, well, maybe we'll need it sometime. And so then um, somebody pulled them all together and started picking up the pieces and putting it together and making a coat of many colors. And I'm saying the remnant out here is where we want to be. We want to be something that doesn't really fit into the body, the church, and just be church people. But we want to be used by God. And so God is going to bring all these pieces that don't fit into the body of uh, the church exactly and bring them together. And then the, as I was thinking of all this in my mind, it's like the, the spirit just spoke to me and said, and make a coat of many colors. So to me, being a coat of many colors represents um, people from all over coming together to be a glorious church. So I don't know if you followed everything I said there. But sometimes we don't feel like we fit into just a normal everyday church. We want hopefully to be more than just that. And God going to take the pieces here, there, and everywhere and bring them, call them out maybe, and bring them together as a church of many colors. So just thought I'd share that. We, when, I, when that just kind of clicked in my mind, I was, uh, thought that was pretty special. Okay, um, now Eli, the priest, was very old and heard all that his sons did unto Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, why do you such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. He said, nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You, have, you make the Lord's people to transgress. 
I don't, I'm not sure why I got all that in here. So let's just go down here. And Samuel, the child grew on, was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. So the point here is that a barren woman prayed, God granted her request, and she brought forth a child. And now he's he's in the temple serving God, and he's a, a righteous young man. First Samuel 3. Uh, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days, and there was no open vision. So there was no um, regular communication between God and his people because uh, Israel was away from the Lord, and God was not moving and speaking, and there was no open vision between them. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down to his place, and his eyes, this is chief priest now, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down. Okay, I didn't want to bring all that in here. Uh, anyway, I wanted to bring out right here that Eli was a chief priest and his eyes were dim. And I wanted to show you something later about Moses and, and his vision. But uh, anyway, God showed uh, Samuel, even though he's a little child, God showed him some things about the priesthood and said he was going to bring it to an end. Uh, let me go on down. I didn't mean to have all this here. Um, First Samuel 319, and Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did not let none of his words fall to the ground. Okay, here's uh, the scripture I wanted to bring out about... Um, Moses and his visions. No, no, it's not either. This is about the eagles. Remember the woman uh, was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. Um, here's what God said to Moses, I believe. Let's read it. And Moses went up unto God and the Lord called him uh, out of the mountain saying, thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, tell the children of Israel, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, that's your enemy, and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. That's exciting to me because we just read that the woman went into the wilderness on the wings. Uh, she was given two wings of a great eagle. So I'm just comparing that back to when God brought uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, I bear you on eagle's wings. So that's very interesting how that all connects. Let me see if I got anything. Yeah, here, here's what I wanted to bring out about uh, Eli's vision versus Moses' vision. So Eli was kind of not very uh, spiritual priest, and he said he was 90 and 8 years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see, and that compares to Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So when I saw that years ago, I said, wow, look at that. It's just something, a spiritual message there. Uh, even though it's talking about our physical vision, that if we're close to God, then we, we have good vision, maybe not literally, <laughs> but we're in tune. Uh, I got, a, um, I got a, a, a saying right up here on my bulletin board that I uh, ran across several weeks ago that I really like it. Let me see if I can, um, in fact, here's part of it right here. It's talking about vision, and I really like this. It says, it is not necessary for every part of the body to see, but it is necessary that the eyes do. So in other words, not everybody's called to be the eyes of a church, but sometimes I feel like maybe we are in a way because we see things that other people have not seen yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and I just feel like sometimes that we have a so message and a ministry, if God wants to use us, to be the eyes for other churches somehow. I don't know how, because we see things that they don't see. I, that's just the way I feel about it. Um, there's a little bit more of that to say. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, yeah, it says it is necessary that the eyes see. The eyes see on behalf of of the entire body. So uh, I just like really like that saying right there because sometimes I feel like our what we have, what we see is important and God might use us in some kind of ministry or somehow 
to to see for the rest of the church or for, for other portions of the church. So I don't know if you're following me there, but uh, I just sometimes I feel like we have things to do that because of what the Lord has given us. So that makes sense to you, Al. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> sometimes I just have this feeling that there's things, there's things that we might eventually be doing or something because of the knowledge which the Lord has given us. So I don't know if uh, I feel like I didn't share that too well, but uh, to me, the the idea, the parallel of Hannah bringing forth, I mean, Hannah was barren, but yet she prayed and God allowed her to bring forth a male child and he replaced the dead church of Eli with a righteous church. So that's uh, amazing to me. And then we have the, the woman bringing forth the man child in revelation and a very righteous male child. So there it is uh, all the way back in the old Testament fits right along with revelation. So anyway, that's uh, today's lesson. So anybody got any comments, thing to say, testimony? I'm gonna to have to go. I've got we got service here in about 25 minutes, so I'm gonna have to yeah, get going. You better get going. Bye. Nice seeing everybody. Nice seeing you, Sherry. You should have brought gave me something to drink. I'm sorry, you want some water? <laughs> Good seeing y'all. Y'all have a uh, thanks for coming there. Right, so. Yeah, it was enjoyable. I enjoyed it. It's better being part of it than just watching it. But anyway, okay, right. I'll talk to y'all later. God bless you. Okay, yeah, thanks. I'll give you something to think about and study on, huh? Yeah, I have to work on that. All right, tell Melody we'll be praying for her. Thank Bye. you. Thank okay, you. we'll see you. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, my uh, just got bigger. Do what? Oh, yeah. Um, Everybody just got bigger. I'll share something uh, that happened in our area just recently. There was a, a girl, 12 years old, and she had a massive heart attack. And uh, she was in such bad shape. Of course, they got her to the hospital. And, man, there was a picture of her. I, don't, I didn't know they could put that many intravenous uh, needles in somebody. I don't know why she had so many, but she, Karen says part of a bypass. But she, her heart was so bad, they were – they had her in a medically induced coma and they were keeping her alive by machines because her heart was like out of it. Right. And um, in fact, she was on, she, they got her on a list for a heart transplant, 12 years old. And she was number one. And is that the whole state of Tennessee? I, think the whole United States. I, I don't know. Yeah, maybe the whole United States. Anyway, she was at the top of the list because she's so young and it's, she had such a total failure of her heart. And People started praying all around here, and all the churches were asked to pray. And um, make the story short, before it was over, her heart started uh, picking up and getting better and better. And I mean, she was had total failure and was completely on a list for a transplant, and started beating. And now she's off uh, all the machines, and they had uh, something down her throat to help her breathe. She pulled that out, of course she was she started doing better and now they're saying that she's completely her heart's completely healed up i mean going from all the way from not even functioning at all to being healed now she's still got to go through some therapy and this that and the other but man that's incredible so everybody's saying that, that girl that girl had a miracle from god because the church prayed call from sherry Fleck. call from uh, sherry Fleck. yeah Karen, yeah, but I, uh, the Advil and uh, what was the other one? I didn't want those because I have ibuprofen. That's the same thing as Advil. And, and, uh, I don't know what the other one is. Okay. You share them with us there, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, anyway, it's just, that's what it's happens. Hurting. That's what happens when you're live, huh? So. It's all right. Uh, it's been good. Next week, uh, I'm not sure. I got to think a minute where we're going next, but uh, all this is part of eschatology, and we're trying to give a broad overview and pull a whole lot of things together. So, um, are we here next week? Do what? We meet next week. Yeah, I guess.
Well, I'll next week come to your house. Well, you're supposed to come uh, Sunday <laughs> or Saturday, but uh, well, you can be you can sit in on from it's this Mother's end. Day. Well, I know. Okay. Well, unless somebody it's still says Sunday. Can't. Do I? <laughs> I said it's still Sunday. Yeah, right. that's right. So we can do both. Okay. Uh, Along those uh, those uh, lines, I was actually thinking about that. You know, the Bible says uh, to honor your father and mother. And uh, uh, years ago, I ch I changed the wording a little bit because sometimes the word honor is like, what does that mean exactly? And uh, I came up with consider them valuable. And that just helps you think a little bit more. And I know um, sometimes we don't. I, as I'm getting older, I look back and sometimes I wish I had... Uh, I had considered my parents more valuable, and now you wish you had. But Daniel had two wives. <laughs> two wives. What'd she say? Uh, I said it was, uh, you know, back in the Old Testament, they had two wives. I said, Larry, you can go get you another wife. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need one. I don't need one. <laughs> Next week is uh, Mother's Day, so remember your mothers, and uh, if you have them still, and. Uh, um. Wayne, uh, I'm, I'll be out of town. My granddaughter is getting uh, graduated from UT, okay. Knoxville. So okay. um, hopefully we can listen to the recording. Yeah, I'll record it and put it on YouTube like I've been doing. So. Oh, good. Okay, uh, yeah, we had listened uh, to the recording. It it, it kind of helps to listen to it again. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Yeah, that YouTube is working out fairly well i'm surprised i was able to figure out how to upload it but yeah but I worked out good it, so. <laughs> so thank all of you for coming and i hope uh got something out of today's message and we'll uh see you next week thank you thank you, thank you. all right bye, bye.